What's up, buddy? Hey, Mike. How are you? Good, Robbie. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty fired up this week. Oh, that's good. That's good to yeah, know. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Uh, I'm full of hope. Full of hope? Yeah. Why not? You've been watching, like, the presidential press conference or something? <laughs> yeah. That, is, <laughs> that always fires me up, man. Uh, I knew it. I figured that's why uh, That's why you pushed the our podcast cast recording till a little bit later i know you were sitting on the edge of your seat no i really didn't watch that in fact i'm really not watching news i think it's um bad karma um as we i'm sure you probably won't disagree with that so no i'm not gonna disagree i've been more focused on the process of trying to return my new swim paddles because despite our podcast on swimming and your instruction, I ordered the wrong size. <laughs> Michael. Well, I mean, you know, I had... Honest mistake. Honest, honest mistake. mistake. I just went with the color. You know, I saw my color. You know, I don't know why. I don't oh, know. my God. Yeah. You're, you're, like the, you're like the woman that wins the NCAA tournament bracket because she picks their favorite mascots and team colors. I know. I know. I don't, I don't understand why they have so many different colors, and I just thought I ordered the same kind I had, which were perfect, which were stolen from me. Anyway, so I got, I'm in this big thing because I, I sent out the, finally got around to sending out the T-shirts, and I realized how much I cannot stand going to the post office. Um, it is. Oh, God, yeah. It's the purgatory of all purgatories. It's like going into a bad thrift shop with uh, really angry people. It's just bad. <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't know. So I, I, I've ordered from Swim Outlet, and they are awesome. I mean, they, are, they ship, like, almost before the order's finished. And uh, I got the paddles, and they're the wrong size. And they, they will, you know, take them right back without a problem. But I've, I don't know how many times I've ordered something and never returned it, even though it sucked. And I think some of the goggles might be in your swim bag right now. <laughs> Because I gave them to you. <laughs> the Zogs? I'm yeah, the Zogs. I'll check. I think you got. The, I know you're a Zog fan, but hey, yeah, I think hey. I'll check on that. Maybe I. Maybe uh, I think I gave those back. No, I didn't want them. They were the high end Zogs, oh. and I couldn't get them to work. They kept leaking and fogging up on me. I don't know what it was. So, but. You, so you gave me you gave me a faulty product as a generous gesture as your friend. Well, I thought maybe your body chemistry would make them work better, and mm. maybe my eyes are too steamy. Good. Got it. So those all those leaks I had at the um, at Wisconsin, I can blame on our friendship. In fact, if you wore the Zogs, yeah. Yeah, I don't remember what I wore to be honest with you. How can you not know, man? I mean, I'm a Zog guy through and through. I mean, I know you are. I know you are. So if you're, you're out there listening, Zogs, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you want a solid uh, middle to front pack age group endorsement, I'm in. Especially if I got to pay you. Yeah, seriously. You were, yeah, he's definitely in. Is that a big thing? And by the way, the uh, the paid and uh, the, the athlete paying to be a um, sponsored athlete. Oh, it's huge. <laughs> it's it's huge. Uh, I know. think uh, Lena Burrell, if you're listening, and I know she is. She, <laughs> we she ranted about this the other day. That's uh, it's like you're not a sponsored athlete if you have to sign up for a certain amount of these people's races, pay money, and then pay money for product, bikes, and whatever. It's, you're, it's yeah, anyway. That's not, but before we get started, because I don't want to go off another tangent, but you and I share a, a distinct love, neither one of us are big TV guys, but we share a distinct love for one epic TV show. Uh, we're both huge Seinfeld fans. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And, and over over the holidays, you know, <clears throat> I always do kind of airing of grievances uh, in the spirit of in the spirit of Seinfeld, and there's there's two just two quick things I want to get off my chest if you if you don't mind giving me a minute. All right, man. It is uh, it's a little late for the holidays, but I'll give it to you. I'll give okay. You All right. Anyway, so the first one is I I'll make it quick, but I had an athlete uh, that I've been working with and that had been told a million times that. Breathing every three to five strokes was the way to go, and if you breathed every every stroke, it was bad for your neck, and you would only have one dominant side. I'm not going to go on to a huge tangent, but this is the worst possible advice you could probably ever give somebody. Wow. Um, so if you're listening and you breathe every three to five strokes, stop it right now. 
breathe every stroke. I told him this, and he went to the pool and took uh, five seconds off per 100, and I will quote him, it felt like I was doing 25% less effort. So moving on, if you do that, stop it. We'll touch on another basis. And the other one's really just more of a a general pet peeve. Um, he Another athlete texts me it's a picture of this shirt that I guess a triathlete was wearing, and it says... Crushing iron? Oh, no, that wouldn't be an airing of grievances. That'd be like a an airing of love. Okay. Uh, it says, oh, you ran a marathon. That's so cute. Maybe when you grow up, <laughs> maybe when you grow up, you'll let your your mommy will let you do the rest of the race, swim, bike, run. Like, are you kidding me? You are exactly what is wrong with our sport. If you wear that shirt, you're exactly what is wrong with our sport. Because although that shirt might be in jest, shirts are a lot like text messages in a serious conversation. You can't tell somebody's tone. You can't see their facial expressions. You can't know if they're serious. But if somebody reads that shirt, they're going to think, A, you're kind of a douche. B, I'm never doing triathlon because that's the kind of people that are within the sport. So if you wear that kind of stuff, stop it because you're bad for the sport. Moving on. That's all I got. Well, I mean, on a serious point, um, as a, you know, I've been around the sport five years and there was a time when I sort of started leaking into that territory of, you know, almost a bit of condescension. And I think we've all been there. It's easy to go. So, you know, it's the old, uh, yeah, my marathon's a cool down or whatever kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, yeah. so, but I, I think it's, I think you're right. I mean, I agree with that. You know, I can see how it can happen. Um, it's easy to, you know, get psyched up and stoked about who you are and what you're doing and everything like that. But yeah, I mean, the the bottom line is, again, we're going back into that ego thing and about, you know, I mean, how many triathletes are there in the world? It's not like you're, you know, one of the few to climb Mount Everest barefoot, you know, (laughs) you're just doing something, you know, it's not, it's, and, and plus, I'm sure that most of the people that only run marathons will clock you in a marathon. You know, uh, I was I was just I was just about to say I think we should do like a crushing iron shirt that says, "Oh, you did an Ironman. At least I ran my whole marathon." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're listening, you want to pre-order. We're all ears, but I think that's a I think that's gold. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Well, maybe we'll tweak the verbiage on that a little bit to make it less condescending. Yeah. Because the condescension yeah. is the part that we're not into, and I think it that, is. Yeah, it drives me insane. We're going to um, address that a little bit in a certain way here because we're going to talk about, um, you know, sort of the beginning stages of triathlon if you're just getting yes. into it and what what's it all about and how you should approach things like um, signing up for the race, picking the right race, location, time of year, and things like that. What, um, you know, why, finding your why as to why you're doing a triathlon, what's your goal. And then also getting into a little bit of what you have to have, you know, what items would be good to start with and what would you want versus what you need to start your career as a triathlete, Um, how to set up your success plan and how to know if you're ready to go to the next level, next distance. So does that sound about right, buddy? Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that's a great great topics to cover, and, and I want to make sure that we we hit on those because I know that you know just from you and I's background, we we do touch a lot on the longer distance stuff, and I know we have a, a lot of listeners that are you know new to the sport and are just getting into it and do the sprint and Olympic distance, and and I want to make sure that we're you know reaching that audience as well, and and as well as the ones who who have gone further, we can all remember you know the first time we actually. You know, we, the first triathlon we ever did. Um, you know, and I think that I want to make sure we can help as many people as we can, and hopefully that's what we can accomplish today. Yeah, and I think it's going to even help me. And I've I've been you know through some Ironman races now, and I kind of think you 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 lose and you sort of forget where you came from, and it's always good to look back at it and maybe you know going back and revisiting some of the basics and the skills that uh, might help me get better. You know, kind of a la. Tiger Woods, how he went back and changed his swing, and then it got worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of maybe some other outside circumstances. Oh, yeah, that's probably true. Probably led to that. Yeah, that's true. All right, so I know you've got some thought, a lot of thoughts on this, but um, let's say, um, let's say I'm thinking about doing a triathlon, man. And uh, what what kind of things should I consider 
before doing my first race? You know, I think, you know, before, you know, we get into that, you know, I think I might want to jump a little bit further and do the, you know, what, what, what makes you, what made you decide that you even wanted to do one? Okay. You know, what, what made you decide that you even wanted to do a triathlon? That's something that, that I deal with, um, day to day in, in managing, operating two gyms is, you know, it takes a lot of guts for people to walk into a gym for the first time. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it takes, you know, and it's not like they just figured out they wanted to lose weight or they wanted to get in shape. You know, something had to click. And when we sit down with people, you know, our biggest purpose to get them to hopefully buy into a sustainable life of, of health and wellness is, you know, tell me your why. Why did you really come in today? Oh, I want to lose weight. Okay, I get that. But what makes you want to lose weight? You know, what made you come in today? Um, you know, and I'll, I'll give an example of a, a lady that I worked with and it took me about 30 minutes and finally she was just like, you know, I went to, I went on a family vacation this last summer and we hiked in the mountains and my two sons and my husband went to the top of the mountain and I couldn't because I was so overweight and out of shape. And there's this picture that they have and I'm not in it. Oh man. That's, yeah, that's huge. Yeah, that's. It's it's huge, and that's the kind of stuff that you need to get people to to grasp on, and to hold on to, and to you know really let it sink in, and because that's what keeps you going, you know, is that thought. And I think that's the same the same approach can be said to taking up a new sport, you know, later, you know, as we all are, you know, pretty much later in life is. You know, why do you why do you want to do it? Do you want to do it to lose weight? Do you want to do it to feel good about yourself? Do you want to do it because your friends are doing it? Do you want to do it to push yourself to to your limits and grow? Um, you know, I think there's there's a million different r- right answers. You I know, th- and, and I think and I think that's the important thing is that I think people get lost in the sport as we as we kind of get sucked in. You know, and we talked about this before. Is that you know why you started it to begin with? You know, and 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 that's going to change and evolve over time, like it has for me. But you know, I, th- I just think it's really, really important. Um, like I got into the sport to lose weight. Yeah, and I, I was I weighed fifty pounds more than I do now. And the first the first triathlon I did was in Hilton Head Island when I lived there, and it was on the I rode the my beach cruiser on the beach, I swam in the ocean and I ran on the beach. That was my first one. Um, I'll never forget it, um, and I think it's just always good to kind of go back and you know not just appreciate your roots, but remember what kind of spurred on the original spark that that caused this huge flame that is people's passion for the sport of triathlon. Yeah, and of course I remember mine. Mine was a sort of a similar thing with the picture, but it was a video of me overweight singing after a football game and a lot of a lot of months and years of uh, heavy drinking and things like that. But the ultimate reason was, you know, I'd always been act fairly active, but I got into a streak, right? And I started getting older, and my thought process was, I was getting to the point where if I let it go again, I might not get it back. You know, so I think that you can always. I think people go through these streaks where they sort of start getting out of shape and everything like that, and they think they can just turn it back on. But it gets tougher, you know. Obviously, as the older you get, and for me, it was almost. It almost felt like my last shot to really regain um, that health and wellness back. And so I started, you know, running, and then that turned into triathlon. And I remember my first triathlon. Well, it was a sprint down here in Nashville. And the one thing I remember most about it, other than how awesome I felt when I was done with a full body workout versus just running, that was the main one. Another reason I wanted to specifically do triathlon because running alone wasn't um, taking care of my body well enough. But the the one memory I really had was um, just how ridiculous I felt coming out in a tri kit <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> I mean, I felt like a complete weirdo man i don't know is this that tight whole tight thing or whatever and i i just think that people should keep that in mind that you know i think we we think we look cool but for most people you look we look kind of like idiots oh man my my (laughs) wife my wife calls it my outfit your outfit she's like you're gonna wear your outfit i'm like it's not an outfit yeah it's it's a tri suit and like that sounds any better yeah. But you know, I do think it you know gives you perspective of if we're gonna 
We're going to swim. We're going to come out of the water looking like we just came out of the birth canal. Mm-hmm. We're going to wear these wear these iron, these tight, you know, spandex suits and put on this funny looking helmet like it came from the movie Coneheads and then and then run, walk and maybe pee and poop on ourselves. Like yeah. how glamorous is it really? I mean, it's just, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, that's an that's an outstanding point. Yeah. So next time you, you know, you feel the urge to get condescending about being a triathlete kind of put in perspective yeah take a look in the mirror literally (laughs) (laughs) and get out of that thing as soon as you can right after the finish (laughs) um all right and i think that's a great point and just you know finding your purpose and and why you're doing i think is really important and and that'll lead us into that next one is you know what things to consider before signing up for your first race um you know, I know we've touched on this, you know, location, the brand of the race, the race management company that puts it on, and the time of year. You know, those are all things that, that you should really take into consideration and what you're, you know, and, and basically what you're willing to prepare for and what you're, and I always tell people this is usually for longer distance stuff just because it is so time consuming, but having your family, your spouse, your kids, um, close friends, you know, even if they're not familiar with uh, the sport. I mean, my mom and dad, like, they still call it a marathon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've been doing it for 10 years, and they're like, what are you doing again? I'm like, anyway. You know, it, it, but having that support will help kind of erase, not just erase any guilt for taking time away, but have them support you in this endeavor that's supposed to be a real growth opportunity and something that's going to be good for you. So, you know, finding support. And then lo- we'll start with location is, you know, pick a location that's comfortable that's close to home and I could not recommend enough doing a local small race as your first race. Um, there is nothing like waking up in your own bed before a race and driving to the race location that next morning. I mean, it's, it makes life infinitely easier, not to mention cheaper. It makes it infinitely easier. Yeah. The location, I think if it's close and you don't have to deal with all the travel stresses of forgetting things and, you know, not packing what you need or whatever, and I, I I'm with you on that. I mean, yeah, it's just there's something about it. You know, eating breakfast in your own kitchen, you know, prepping things like you want. It's just it's a huge deal. And let's um, face it, dude. I mean, those races are less stressful. I remember. I mean, it it when you do an Ironman brand race, it, there's a little bit more, um, you know, butterflies going around wh- whether you like it or not. It's just there's just so many more people and just the energy is, and, which is great, which is why i love doing those races too but it can be a little daunting at first i think if that you know if you just jump right into some kind of iron man race out of the gate it might deflate i don't know you can talk yeah about yeah that. yeah i think that's and that kind of goes around next bullet is, is you know the the brand that you choose mm-hmm. you know i you know people people compete for different reasons for different brands um you know i guess brand and race management can be sandwiched together but you know, I, the Iron Man, it's a it's a brand and it's a logo. It it isn't a distance um, because people run that distance thousands of their races across the year um, in different states, all over in different places all over the world. Um, it's not the end all be all. It just isn't. And I know that we've Charlie like to make it. Oh, I've done an Iron Man, and they would pay five hundred dollars more to do that race versus an actual the same distance probably a harder course um but they want to say they did the actual iron man you know I, I always suggest choose a local a local race some grassroots race it'll be so much more or less key even uh just really really well put on i mean i remember i did gulf coast uh before it came an iron man branded race i did it i think six years in a row um it a you get to go to the beach um Two, it was always really, really well put on. Um, you know, the the roads were totally closed to traffic, um, which is a huge plus. Um, and it was just great. It it was big enough to where it wasn't uh, to where you you always kind of had somebody in your sight, but it wasn't too many people to where it was always crowded. Um, and I just enjoyed it. You know, I I didn't. And there's always good. There's always going to be good competition. There might just be. There might just not be as much of it. Um, and I, so I think you know, choosing you know a race that 
in a race management company, especially if it's local, that that puts on a lot of races and it's, it's support them and sign up for their races and get to know, you know, the people that you train with and race with locally, you know, can be a really really great resource for continuing on in the in the sport and and that's and that's something that you can really do easily if you participate locally um, at these these more grassroots style races. Yeah, for sure, and I think. Um you know what my favorite race is outside of any Ironman races I've done, and, and it's no longer there, but Rev 3, I always thought they put on really nice races, and I can tell you this much, that I did that four years in a row, and I have more triathlon friends from that particular race than I have from all the other Ironman races combined. I think that because of the smaller uh, cast that you have more opportunity to genuinely connect with people and stuff like that. I think at most Ironman races, people are there with families and groups of people and there's always so much going on and things like that that you don't really get that genuine um, time to hang out and meet people and, you know, share stories and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. I think that's why it's important to kind of choose one that's going to be the least amount of stress. Um, you know, and that kind of leads to also time of the year. You know, I, I'm a huge fan of choosing one earlier in the year, you know, late April, May, just because it gets your feet wet. You know, you've been training all all winter and, and if for no matter what the distance is. And just to get your feet wet and do a race, the temps are more than likely always going to be favorable no matter where you live in the country. Um and in that it kind of gives you an opportunity to say, all right, what do I want to do the rest of the year? Or or do I want to do another one? You know, I think that's something else that, that we should touch on later is, you know, you, doing one doesn't mean you have to do them all. And, you know, most people get the bug or they don't get the bug. You know, it's just – that's kind of how it is with a lot of things in life. But, you know, it's it's more favorable conditions. Um, you know, there's less to worry about. And, you know, you it's the longer you train without racing, the harder it is to keep it up um, because you, you kind of need that. It's great to have a goal, but – <clears throat> it's it's also great to be able to accomplish it. And so I think that's also important is to give yourself a taste of the reward that you've been working so hard towards. And, and yeah, I don't know what it is about races, but <clears throat> as we've talked about many times, they can literally be miserable because, you know, like, you know, like a real hard training day, like those kind of feelings, but the, the satisfaction of finishing and being around people that you just did it with is that really goes a long ways. And um, I, I agree. I, I think that having a manageable race early just to kind of get the feel for it and then you can sort of take it where it goes after that. But, yeah, I think that the last thing you want to do is, is schedule a tough race early in the year and just lose your momentum. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's not good for the for the psyche. Yeah, I did that um, in New Orleans. I started it. I went to New Orleans and did New Orleans man, half, yeah. and that just about talked me out of triathlon. That could be a whole podcast. There, your the moment when you met your destiny of quitting triathlon. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was just a tough day, and um, it was early in the year, and it was yeah, touch and go as to whether I would keep going. Was that the year I ended up doing Louisville on the last moment kind of thing? I think it was. You and I both did it. Yeah. That was, tw- that was 2013. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really didn't think I was going to. I thought that might have been, New Orleans might have been my last triathlon of the year, to be honest. And then it took me a couple of week- months to get back into mindset. And then I was, and Louisville never sold out at that point. Um, so I got into it maybe a couple months ahead of that race. But anyway, so just, I guess. You know, do something you know that you're going to enjoy. That's not going to be too tough early in the year. If you're yeah. just getting in, for sure. Yeah, there was just there's is absolutely zero need to put that much pressure on yourself. There's zero, um, and it gives you a good chance to do a warm up. It's kind of like a dry run, a dry rehearsal. You know, yeah. of, of what you want to do. It, it's work the kinks out, and, and no matter how long you race, <laughs> you learn something new every single time um and so you know the best experience sometimes is just jumping in and getting your feet wet and figuring it out um you know i think that's that's a great a great way to do it and i think that brings us to our our next topic is you know there's such a stigma of triathlon that it's such an expensive sport um that it's the white collar privileged um 
you got to make over a hundred k a year, um, you know, to do the sport. Um, and, and to an extent, you know, I think, and I've used this analogy a, a lot, is that, you know, I think triathlon is like the way golf was in the late '90s, early 2000s. Was it was more of a a sport of stature and you know entitlement and look what i can participate in it kind of more of as a sporting trend than an actual growing sport um and unfortunately the participation of the sport has shown that the last couple of years but um it doesn't have to be that way you know it's it's a it's trendy for some it's a passion for others and for a lot of people it's just a means to continue to be healthy um but there are definitely items that you have to have there are items that would, you know, be nice to have, and then there are items that you just have them because you want them. Um, and you know, I, I think we should spend a lot of time on probably the have tos and then the want tos, and people can decide in the middle. But um, you know, for a sprint distance and Olympic distance, there are those ultimate ones you have to have. You know, I'll start with the swim, and you can knock out the bike, Mike. But swimming, you need goggles. If you're if you have you know a decent amount of hair, um, you're gonna have a swim cap. I've, I never owned one when I had hair because they always gave them to you at a race. So if you want to save two fifty, they'll give you a cap at the race because they have to. Um, and for swimming, that's pretty much it. Um, even if it's a wetsuit legal race, by no means, like no, there is no reason to go out and purchase a wetsuit for a sprint or an Olympic distance um, race, unless it's going to be so cold that you need to, to stay warm, do not purchase a wetsuit. It's okay to rent one, but I will tell you this right now, no matter what distance you go up to, most triathletes, it takes them longer to get out of their wetsuit than it does for them to actual, than it does the time they actually save while wearing it. So, Forego the wetsuit, you know, rock the skimmies, um, you know, rent one if you feel it's necessary, but by, by no means just by hop, get a wetsuit just because, you know, it's just, it's a lot of money. Um, get a pair of goggles and a swimsuit and call it a day. And plus, yeah, if you're going to train at the pool, we've talked about pool buoys a lot. They're usually at the pool. You don't need to buy one of those. Um, a lot of times they have paddles there. I'm not gonna say we recommend the exact brand but i mean they have stuff at the pool that you can use so just swim a lot and buy goggles (laughs) Uh, seriously yeah swim a lot buy goggles they offer they give you a pool buoy sometimes they have paddles and you know we talk about using the band a lot i don't even use a band i use a race belt which a lot of a lot of uh race a lot of race companies give you a race belt in your in your packet I mean, I think the only ones I have are given to me from races, and I use those as my ankle strap because they're really comfortable, and I can just you know snap in and out. But super cheap, uh, definitely the cheapest version or the cheapest leg of the of the sport and, and cycling <laughs> is by far the most expensive. Yeah, and for more on that uh, swimming in the band and things like that, we have that podcast, How Not to Suck at Swimming, that you can go check out. It's really good. There's a lot of great stuff in there. Um, as far as cycling goes, you know. This is the one where I've always been a um, pretty decent little cyclist, you know, naturally. I guess I rode a lot of mountain bikes, so, I mean, I don't want to rehash that. But when I was going, I wanted a triathlon bike. And instead of a – there's the difference you – can, you can say this, but the difference between a traditional, you know, like road bike that you would think of when you think of, you know, maybe like hearing the words 10 speed or something like that and the difference between a tri bike is the tri bike is built to go straight and fast and it's a lot stiffer. Is that pretty much the general y- yes. difference? Yes. Yeah, and e- yeah, even the, the way the tubing is shaped, the bottom bracket is, the length of the chain stays. I mean, everything is different, and they are much, much more difficult to handle than a road bike, obviously. Yeah. And for my first one, two, three, uh, one sprint and two Olympic triathlons, I rode a road bike that I borrowed from a friend. And it was plenty fine, and I was right. I was probably in the top of my age group, top 20% of my age group on a road bike. So, at the distance of sprint and Olympic, you can certainly are not going to, you know, especially a lot of the courses, maybe with a lot of turns and things like that. The tri bike is going to be 
very difficult to get used to if you're not used to riding it. It's just a whole different um, body position and, and stuff like that. And then I think it's just as easy to, you know, try out a couple bikes. I mean, and then when I finally got to the point where I said, all right, I signed up for um, Ironman Wisconsin and I thought, well, I need a tri bike now. And for whatever reason, I still don't know if I would have actually needed it in that race if I'd had a good <laughs> road bike, to be honest. But, um, when I did get one, I went to Craigslist personally, and I got—I guess I got kind of lucky because I found a guy who who had like ten bikes, and he had happened to just buy this tri bike because he just wanted to have one. He thought it would be cool, and he rode it maybe one time. And the hint or the clue as to how to buy on Craigslist is to uh, go into the description, and if you see, if you get a sense that whoever's selling it is a real tech head and you know and get the sense that they are meticulous about caring for their bikes and they know everything about them that's the place to go i think and a lot of times those people just collect bikes and you know this thing literally had i don't know maybe 10 miles on it and i got it for maybe half price of what it would normally be sticking with i mean especially for getting into the sport don't invest in a sport you're not sold on Mm-hmm. You know, it's just it, there's no reason to. You know, everybody might have a lot of people might have one. They're by no means necessary. You know, you can, you know, get a pair of clip-on aero bars to put on your road bike, and pretty much everybody in, on this podcast that has a tri bike at some point has been dusted by somebody who rode past them on a road bike um, with clip-on aero bars. You know, it's just it's just not that. It's just not that necessary. You know, if you, the more you move up in distance and, you know, let's be honest. I mean, no matter what um, distance the race is, Sprint Olympic 70.3 or, or full, there's only about 10 or 15 actual people trying to win. The Where, where the effects of a road bike or a tri bike actually makes that difference for them. Yeah. The, the, the other thing is just not, you know, and, and – uh, I mean, I saw the year you and I did Louisville in 2013. I saw a guy ride past me, although I, I ended up passing him again because that's just the nature of the day, on a road bike with flatbed pedals, wearing yeah. tennis shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could, and he was just doing it because he wanted to do it. you know. And, and I don't know what his time ended up being. And, um, you know, you don't have to get sucked into – the I mean, I, f- spending money on gear is the fourth discipline of triathlon, um, and people just waste money on stuff all the time. I mean, I was was uh, given a hard time to one of my athletes the other day. He was like, "My my nine twenty is not working." Um, you know, I wasn't able to get. You know, I'm going to have to use my my chrono watch or the the lap clock. You know, to do my swim, and I was like, "Oh, woe is me." You know. You have to use the same training tool that Katie Ledecky uses every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like, oh, your life is so rough, you know, to count your laps. You know, look at the wall clock and go to work. Yeah. You know, it's like people love, I love, you know, in people, especially in triathlon, I feel like, you know, they they love them some gadgets. I mean, they will rock their like 920s, 24 hours a day, even back in the day where they like just came out and they looked like you were carrying like a laptop on your wrist. You know, people people just like gadgets, and <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, is that really necessary? Like, it's really not. Um, it's like, is that is is that an etch a sketch you're balancing on your wrist, or is that your tri watch? I'm not sure. Yeah. Before we get get out of cycling, I just want to make one point about aero bars too, because that sort of like is what people think makes a tri bike. I think if you don't know what you're talking about, you know, you see the aero bars, it's like, oh, that's a tri bike, but it could be on a road bike first of all, but secondly. Once I got on my tri bike um, and had aero bars for the first time, I'd say that it took me at least a year to get to the point where actually being an aero was an advantage for me because it's, oh, it was a different. God, yes. It was a different. It was so hard for me to stay in aero and create the same amount of power, and it's 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 all about you know wind resistance and um, being aerodynamic. And it does make a huge difference, but until you can get to the point where you're in that kind of shape to remain in that position, it can be um, probably more detrimental. I mean, even when I rode Wisconsin, my first Ironman in you know with aero bars, um, I rode most of that 
not in aero bars <laughs> because it was just more comfortable for me and yeah for whatever reason that my back would hurt and it would just be a, a harder on my legs so i was not even in aero a lot of times so you know that's one of those things that you kind of start getting used to and fine tuning after you've been in the sport a while that position of aero is not you know automatically going to make you go fast Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean, generally, I think, you know, the sport would be better served if they did, like, you must compete in triathlons for three years on a road bike before you're allowed to get a tri bike. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because, just because the overall handling is so terrible. Um, And and you, you, you nailed it. It was like people go slower because they are wobbly on the front end and they can't take corners very fast. They can't hold their line. Um, you know, it's just, it's not needed, you know, and then, and then there's things like, you know, we'll touch on these quick before we moved on to the run, but there are things like, you know, aero helmets that people spend $300 on. If you can't go over 20 to 21 miles an hour on a, on a short course, don't purchase one waste of money. You're not getting the benefit. Um, save it, you know, use the road helmet you got. Um, it's not going to win or lose you a race. It's not going to win or lose you a podium spot. Um, the same can be set for, you know, the deep dish wheels that cost, you know, two thousand, three thousand dollars and more than people can afford on a car, you know, and you only use them a couple times a year for those people who only race on them. Like if you can, again, if you can't go over 18 miles an hour for a longer distance, like if you look up at the, the white paper, which is what bike companies and wheel companies, um, put out as kind of their PR when they talk about, you know, the wind and effects on aerodynamics and how they compare on different yaw angles, which is like the wind hitting the front of your wheel or your, or your bike at a certain degree. They even like extrapolate out the time savings you have from a 40, a 40 K ride, which is the bike distance of an Olympic through a full Ironman. And we're only talking about, uh, four to six minutes and that's if you can ride at a speed of 21 or 22 plus (laughs) you know so if you can't do that either save the money and don't buy it you can rent them from a company like race day wheels it's like 200 bucks for the race um or you can do like a wheel cover which is like 100 bucks 150 bucks um for the rear wheel and you know lastly are like the front end hydration systems that like Outstanding companies like X Lab, you know, they make great hydration products, but they're all carbon and they all cost like 60, 70 bucks. Um, I have a $16 bottle cage that's plastic uh, connected with zip ties. Um, all in, probably looking at $16.50. Um, and it has always, I've had it on there for probably three years. It's just as aero as any other product. And it's super cheap, you know. It's a, there. There are a lot of ways to not buy, but it's just always easier to buy because it's more fun. It looks cool, and everybody else has one. Yeah, I agree. And if you're gonna, I would like to point out if you think about if you're never or you're not used to race wheels, and you think you want to rent them on the race day, I think that's a bad idea. If you've never ridden with them, because the the wind fact, it, it'll be hard for you. I think. Do yeah, I, I agree with that. But then again. You know, depending on how people, deep they are. We will get that too, but I mean, most people doing it at race day because they haven't trained on them. No, most, more than likely, aren't necessarily going to be competing at such a high speed to where it, um, you know, will dictate a lot of play in the front wheel. But no, I, I agree. You know, it's the old adage like, don't try anything new for race day. Yet yeah, people do it all the time. I do. I agree. So, well, what about the run? The run. For me, I mean, um, I don't know. I I got into a shoe craze when I first started running, um, but now <laughs> I haven't bought a new pair of shoes in probably a year and a half. So it's one of those things. And of course, we you touched on the Garmin issue before, but I have pretty much exclusively, other than an old two hundred five or whatever that a friend gave me that has subsequently died i pretty much run swim with a chrono watch with a I maybe mean, a 28 dollar timex ironman sell out ironman brand 
Yeah, but I, it's it's good. It yeah, does it works. The job. It's a it's a good little chrono watch, and I kind of just I don't know do my thing. And, with and that. yeah, and, and in a on the run portion of a sprint or Olympic distance, you're giving your best effort. You really don't need to know what pace you're running. You just need to know that you can't run any faster. <laughs> that's 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 really it. You don't need to look at you know. Oh, I bet I can average this because it's all going to change. And you're either going to be. And a lot of times, you might be able to run faster than you think, um, and hold on to it. You know, you don't need to look. You just need to hold on for dear life and run as fast as you can from start to finish. That's the nature of a 5K or a 10K in these distances. Just give it your best. You don't need to to spend three hundred fifty dollars, you know, on your watch, um, which and most people only use like one or two functions of it to do one of these races. Like, don't a don't wear a watch. Just go by feel, you know, and just do your best. And don't think you have to have a Garmin or a Polar or a you know Sunto or whatever it is, you know, or an Apple Watch. Uh, <laughs> you didn't like that question. <laughs> oh my god! Like, don't get me started. Um, it's it, okay. People who say they're going to use an Apple Watch to do like intense training are the same people who buy, you know, Grand Cherokees and Hummers and say they're going to go off road. <laughs> no, you're not. Stop. Like you're not. You're not going to do it. I was watching this Grand this commercial today with Allie, and I was like, really, a brand new 2017 Grand Cherokee, and it's like all off road. I'm like, what a bunch of horse crap. There's not a single person who's ever going to buy a Grand Cherokee that's going to go off-road, period. Unless you can consider like, parking in your front lawn, going off-road, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. All right, man. Um, anything else on the run? You don't need a hydration pack, and you don't need to carry it for the run portion of a sprint or an Olympic. You just don't. You don't need a handheld you don't need a Nathan belt or a fuel belt. You just need to grab some from the aid stations. I mean, really, you, I will say a great investment are Yanks for your shoes. Uh, if you don't know what Yanks are, they are kind of a pre-positioned lacing system that's that's elastic that allows you to kind of find you know how tight you want your shoes, and you can slip them on and off without – uh, laces, which does save you a lot of time. I do them now, even for long distance, because I, I think it's more comfortable. I like the give that it has, because uh, the longer that I run, the more my feet swell, and if I've got a little give on the elastic rather than the traditional laces, I feel like it helps my feet out. But um, you know, run hard, and you know, don't wear a watch. I know we're, this is like the anti-sponsorship podcast. Yeah, I think that's the way we're going. Actually, we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying to find no sponsors. Yeah, I'm gonna we're, get. I'm probably gonna get some flack because I live like 15 miles from the Garmin headquarters. Um, and uh, I don't. A, I don't have a problem endorsing Garmin. I like. I like that. Yeah, what's going so. on there. I got um, one right. on the shoelace thing. I got to say, I started with, with Yanks, and I went to that, and then I lo- didn't have them, and then I started just going to. I have my shoes pre-tied all the time now, a little bit loose. Like, what was that Michigan's quarterback who never even laced his shoes up? Remember that guy? Um, I don't know. He no. literally, he did. I don't even think he had late. I don't know. It was the weirdest thing. He didn't. He wore shoes without laces. He probably had some of that elastic in the tongue thing kind of thing. But I always, I keep my shoes. I like them loose a little bit, so I keep them pre-tied and a double knot, and I just slide them on. It's sort of the same thing as a Yanks, but um, for me that works. So. Anyway, don't tie. Yeah, your, think, basically, what we're saying is you don't don't spend time tying your shoes. In, yeah, in exactly. Transition. That's you know. Yeah, that's exactly. a minute off your race. Yeah, done, sold, over. Because your hands will be shaky and off the bike, and they'll be numb. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, maybe. Oh, not. speaking of gloves. <laughs> On the bike, anyway. Don't wear gloves. Yeah, people. I mean, just people get good. Get good bar tape. Yeah, especially when you get used to arrow, you're not going to have to need your gloves so much. You're not off roading it. No, you're not. What's next? How to set up a plan for success? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, probably one of the most important ones. Is is setting yourself up for success. Which is probably going to be based on obviously the race course and the distance, but you know a lot of people will start out, will, will start out with a kind of a what they call like a pool sprint, where the pool where the swim version is in a pool. I mean, most people can do that pretty much now because you can walk. Um, 
but you know setting up um you know setting up your your training plan for a sprint is is fairly I would, I would say it's easy but you know it, it can be complicated depending on what your life is like but it's really just getting in a solid routine of doing something every day you know swim one day bike the next run the next don't get too caught up in doing what so so called brick workouts um, I'm not a huge fan of those anyway but um, is you know just get in enough that you feel like you can i mean honestly most people can probably get off the couch today and do a sprint distance triathlon you just can if you have the equipment and you know i would say the the biggest which and this is for every single distance but the swim is the most terrifying for the for people even if they're doing a pool swim um you see people hugging on the lane lines and and stopping on the wall and like walking i'm like get the proper instruction um no matter where it comes from, as long as it's the right instruction. Um, and unfortunately, like every other day, I'm convinced there's less and less people out there capable of giving good instruction. But um, be comfortable with the swim, no matter what distance it is. You know, sprint because it's your it's your first one, and you can have and you had one. You can have a terrifying experience at a, with a pool swim. Didn't you have a really bad experience at the 80 pi uh, sprint triathlon? Uh, a couple years ago in the pool, it just you kind of hyperventilate, had a couple, had to catch your breath for a, for a couple seconds. Oh yeah, and it was uh, you, in the pool. You this was like you kind of go down, and then you got to swim under the rope to get into the next lane. And this particular pool was a uh, Olympic pool, and we were doing it sideways, I think. But um, it was deep, so <laughs> I got to the maybe the third length leg and uh i tr- i tried to stop and i sunk all the way to the bottom and i mean it was over my head and it was a kind of a freak out but i think what happened there and what has always happened in all of my swims where i've had kind of anxiety issues is i just go out too fast uh you get you get sucked up in the moment and people are all around you and you're kind of trying to stay with everybody but it, from now from you know from this point forward i just always start at my pace and and slower i try to be slower i still fall trap into that trap where you get going you're going that's the things you don't realize is that when a race starts i think you know say you're a two minute swimmer per hundred and you're always going to be going out probably at about 145 or 130 you know even though you're you know what your 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 pace is and it's just the adrenaline of the whole thing and that just gets you so I would recommend, depending on the length of it, just getting in the, because part of it's just hitting the water. If you haven't been in it and you're not used to how the temperature feels, your body's going to kind of clench up or react in such a way that the whole thing just becomes consuming. And just let your body feel the water for a little bit, you know, real slow for that first length of the, the pool swim or for the first 50 yards of the outdoor out, or open water swim or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's your first one. Yeah, exactly. You know, I- enjoy it. You're you're not going to break any records. You're not, you, it isn't the Olympics. You know, set yourself up so you can enjoy it, so you can actually get some accurate feedback on if you're actually going to like the sport or not. You know, I think a lot of people end up not liking the sport because they don't prepare. Um, and that's, and that's usually, that just, uh, that's a good way of just kind of um, taking people out that, you know, won't like it anyway because if you're not willing to do the work to prepare you're never really going to like it anyway um you know and the same you know the sprint and the olympic are probably the two the only two races that i would ever say that it's perfectly fine and i encourage like training over the distance um just because the distances are so much shorter that you're not doing you know these incredible six mile run as long as you're going to do you know, a lot of people can go out and do that in a little over an hour. You know, you're not putting in a ton of this volume that's going to hurt you if you're doing like a 70.3 or a full or, you know, or something else. You know, it, doing the distance and the, in the it, for those shorter races, I, I am perfectly in favor of. Um, I encourage it. I think it helps you psychologically. And it really sets you a good foundation for, um, you know, moving forward and just being prepared. You know, and I think that's that's when you know, you know, if you're ready to go to the next distance. 
you know, if and, and a lot of it, to be honest with you, man, is is based on your life. You know, I I'm one of those guys that believes that you know doing an Iron Man really doesn't make you that special. It just means you have the time, the money, and the availability to train enough to do one. You have the means and you have the time to complete one. Now, the uh, obviously the the most important part is you have to have the willingness and the dedication to put that time in. Right. But you know, but uh, you know, but having said that, is um, you know, doing the volume for the Olympic, it's not a huge change for for a half, and it's about fitting what's going to fit into your life and fit it into where you're going to enjoy it and you can keep doing it. You know, and I think that's the biggest question you need to ask yourself is, am I ready to move up? You know, do I, or A, do I want to move up to the next distance? If the answer is yes, you know, can I? Can I physically? Sure. Can I fit it in from a time management standpoint? You know, maybe not. Um, can I, you know, and then how do I need to budget? What races I sign up for? What equipment do I need? Or do I need any? Um, but I think those are all, you know, really important questions, uh, which again, I think all goes back to the motive and the why of why you got into the sport and wanted to do your first triathlon to begin with. Yep, I agree. And I think the analogy we always talk about uh, that we could use here is uh, in, within an Ironman distance race, you always stress patience and being, you know, sp- you know, looking at the long project in front of you. And I think it holds true with your triathlon development too so as you're starting a sprint don't expect you know to be you know ready to go right away i mean just be patient with your development in each distance and accept that it's going to take a while because it does and then and it will happen you'll break through you know that that olympic distance will seem you know and then within a year might seem kind of short for you so yeah yeah, and I think it sets yourself up for success anyway, because you know the you see a lot of people that you know jump up to the longer distance because they think that you know everybody wants to get to the pinnacle quick, <laughs> you know they want to jump to the Ironman, but you're not ready, and you you very well might have a bad experience because you just started in a sport and now you want to totally I mean, it's totally different training, it's a totally different commitment, it's a totally different race, it's a totally different from a um, from a financial standpoint, I mean, it's couldn't be. It's almost a different sport, um, and you know that's all things people need to take into consideration before they go. Right, why do I really want to do it? Um, and I, I think I talked an athlete out of doing a full this year and to stick with halves. Really, really talented, really fast, gifted runner. Um, wants kind of revenge over a full she did. I think two years ago, and you know, kind of talked her into doing just a short stuff getting faster building and preparing herself so when we do hit the starting line for a full she's really really ready um and which i think a lot of people kind of skip you know they want to skip the the progression and the process and they just want you know they want the fast food ending you know order it now get it now be done with it when the reality is you're missing out on a lot i mean the process and the journey is the most fun you know, it really is. And the more prepared you are and the more educated you are, you know, it's just going to make for an overall better experience and give you a, a much better feedback on, is the sport right for you? Do I love it? Do I not love it? Do I want to keep doing it? Can I keep doing it? You know, and I think those are answers that kind of everybody always asks themselves because everybody's motivation is different. But, you know, I think it's important. Progression is important. And, you know, I think everyone should kind of check themselves and realize that, you know, doing an Ironman doesn't make you a better person. <laughs> you know, it, it does, and it doesn't make you a better triathlete. Um, it just means you wanted to go longer and usually go longer for slower. You know, there are athletes out there that do an, I mean, do an Ironman and then the next year do an Olympic and get murdered. And see and see how much faster some of these people are that just literally just do Olympics. Um, but yeah, I think progression is really really important. Yeah, and uh, listen to your body, let it come to you, grow slowly, and it'll be a lot more enjoyable. Because I do think that, like I said, if you're a runner, 
and you've been thinking about triathlon, I highly recommend it. It gives a better um, all-around body workout. And I just felt a lot better once I got into triathlon and just, you know, off the straight running train. And the same, I think the same could be said for swimmers or cyclists, you know. I think it's a good idea to get a little more rounded in your workouts, and I think you might feel better in the long run. So I would, I'm all behind it. I, if you're thinking about it, I say go for it. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, just feel free to email us at crushingiron at gmail, gmail.com. And we'll... Whoa, you're letting out the southern at gmail.com. Gmail.com. <laughs> Farmers only. Farmers only in these parts. Man, that was a rough one. Yeah, uh, and, I, and before... That was before, a lot of talking, man. That's too much man, talking. Man, no kidding. Before we, before we go and put our overalls on and hop back on the tractor... Um, we, you know, I think the other beautiful thing we talked about in one of our previous podcasts was the expansion of the Ironman brand in North America now gives you the opportunity of committing to yourself before you have to commit financially, and because the races don't sell out anymore. Um, so if you if you're if you're on if you're listening and you're on you're teetering on the idea, start to integrate what it would look like into your life to train for one, and then come May, June, July. Pick one of the and you feel like you're ready, take the leap, you know. But there's not that that expectation and that that daunting goal and and um, investment hanging over your head that that often makes you resent what you do more than love what you do. And if you want to pull the trigger, pull it then. But that's that's like the best thing in the world of this exp- of so many races is so many options is not having to sign up a full year in advance. Yeah, it worked well for CC. It did, it did. It worked well for, 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 for CC. Uh, you got anything else, man? Uh, I really don't. I just uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. We're, we've been uh, getting a lot of that, and uh, I want to maybe encourage some more uh, uh, subscriptions and reviews on iTunes. That'd be awesome. But other than that, yeah. I, I think uh, again, just let us know if you got any questions, and uh, we'll be happy to try and answer them. Yeah, email us, uh, hit us up on Twitter. You know, we had a great week last week. Um, you know, go back and listen to our, some of our previous, you know, podcasts, um, some of the favorites, and, and, and keep hitting us with the questions. I mean, we're happy to answer them, get back to you, and, you know, don't be afraid to ask one that you, that you think might be too, you know, too ridiculous. There's no such thing uh, as ridiculous in triathlon. You know, look in the mirror, we wear spandex. Exactly. And one quick thing, the next podcast not what coming up is on uh, we're going to have a nutritionist, is this correct? No, no, not this one. We're talking like 22nd. Oh, okay. Yeah, nice teaser. <laughs> uh, we'll call that an if you're that's an extended teaser. Extended you know, it's, we got a nutritionist kind of, coming up here. Yeah, here in 2 weeks uh, a really good one will be a great and not just a nutrition talk but an overall body image, um, you know, a healthy relationships with food, stuff like that, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of like the when this the fall season TV is over and they give you that cliffhanger and they're like, it's November. They're like, all right, coming back in March, and you're like, are you serious? I have to wait till. Then. But you know, I will say, Mike, that in the next time we record, um, if I get in the Leadville lottery, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to ask you a tough question. Okay, I'm I'm up uh, for it. You know, so you, you know, it'll be on air, so you kind of gotta you know. You gotta be ready to ready to roll with it. Uh, but that's all I got, man. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. I'd be happy to coach you, like that. That's definitely not the definitely not the question. <laughs> all right, next podcast will be on why you should sponsor CrushingIron.com. All right, man. I'll see you. All right, buddy.